Well, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, there are a few people still coming in, but I think um, uh, we'll go ahead and, and, uh, and just get started. I want to welcome you all to this uh, second presentation in this year's uh, Oceans Alive uh, series that's put on by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Sea Grant Program. Um, I'm filling in for uh, Judy McDowell, our uh, director of Sea Grant Program, who unfortunately had to be away uh, for a uh, director's meeting in Washington this week. She'd much rather be here, I can assure you. Uh, on the way in, I hope that you picked up uh, the schedule of uh, the future uh, presentations. Um, in particular, let me draw your attention to uh, next week's talk by Mark uh, Hahn of uh, our biology department. Mark's going to talk about um, his work using biomarkers and bioassays and assessing the risks of environmental pollutants. And uh, that work uh, relates to um, other talks that we've had, uh, particularly last year, about Massachusetts Bay. Uh, tonight, it's, it's my very good fortune uh, to introduce uh, to you Dr. Mary uh, Malloy of the uh, Sea Education Association. Uh, the, the SEA, uh, or Sea Education Association, is our very, very good neighbor, um, just down the road, the Woods Hole Road, uh, from the Quisset Lab, uh, the Oceanographic Institution. Uh, it's about to, to uh, or will soon celebrate its 25th anniversary. I'm not sure when that is, but I think it's qu within the next year or so. It's, it's, it, and in this, this 25 years, it's, it's achieved a real admirable record of accomplishment. It has a, a very strong academic program uh, and couples that with a rigorous uh, a field program at sea. Uh, there are some um, brochures describing the uh, SEA program, and I encourage you to pick those up uh, uh, on your way out if you don't already have them. Um, I just will say a few words about um, uh, um, uh, Mary Malloy, uh, because uh, she is, well, uh, has a full schedule uh, 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 to, to uh, share with us uh, this evening. Um, I would basically uh, let you know that she got her uh, PhD from uh, Brown University in American Civilization last year, 1994. Um, uh, just prior to that, in 1992, she joined uh, uh, the uh, Sea Education Association for the first time. And uh, she became a full-time uh, faculty member in 1993. She's lectured, lectured extensively on maritime history throughout this country and Canada. And tonight, her subject is Science Under Sail, History of Scientific Voyages. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Malloy. Thank you. I am going to um, introduce you tonight uh, to the relationship between seafaring and science. And I want to start by showing you the world before there was science. And this was the world of the seafarer back before what was actually in the oceans was known. There has always been a very close relationship between sailors and scientific collecting because from ancient times it was travelers who went out to those places beyond the known world and who could bring back examples of uh, wonderful exotic curiosities, even to places um, like the great um, library in Alexandria. Um, Alexander the Great was actually first asked to collect specimens by his tutor Aristotle, and when he set up in the third century BC his great library at Alexandria, he began right away to collect those things which sailors traveling through the Mediterranean could bring to him. They collected shipboard documents, uh, they made maps and charts, they also collected exotic trade goods and things that would tell them about what people were like in the lands beyond their own country. And this was a tradition that really has lasted um, right up until uh, the 20th century when we still have vessels like those belonging to the Sea Education Association that go out and make those kinds of voyages looking for information. Now, it has also been common for sailors to want to participate in the scientific um, um, endeavors of their age. In the 5th century BC, there was a captain from Carthage whose name was Hanno. 
and Hanno was sailing down the coast of Africa, fearing to run into things like this kind of sea monster, and went ashore at what's now Sierra Leone and collected there the skins of some gorillas. Now, first he tried to bring the whole gorillas on board to bring them back to Carthage. Unfortunately, the gorillas caused him a lot of problems, so they ended up killing them and bringing just the skins back. But in the process of bringing these skins back to Carthage, they brought back information of a world which was completely unknown to the Carthaginians. That there could be such animals out there uh, was something that was completely wondrous and strange. When Christopher Columbus came to the New World, one of the things that he did was to collect um, plants and animal specimens, uh, to collect ethnological artifacts, rocks and shells, and also human beings. He brought some people back from the Indies, brought them back to Spain, and there the Spaniards could look and see what the lands were like that Columbus had traveled to. Columbus brought these things back at a time when there was a great, um, when science was not yet defined as something that was completely separate from religion. And it was not uncommon to find things like the bill of a sawfish, which Columbus placed at a church in Siena, uh, to be in someone's collection side by side with a piece of the true cross. They were all part of the mysterious world. And in fact, Columbus himself became um, one of the collectibles. A friend of mine uh, who worked at the American Museum of Natural History told me several years ago that traveling in um, Spain, he went to a cathedral and saw there the skull of Columbus, and that a few days later, in another village in Spain at a different cathedral, he saw the skull of Columbus as a young boy. So Columbus himself <laughs> had entered into the realm of collecting. But for Columbus, when he went into that cathedral and he placed his armor there and the bill of this sawfish that he had brought back, he documented his own voyage in a way that made his encounters with the unusual absolutely concrete. And that's what sailors were beginning to do. Um, also, sailors had access to exotic things that other people couldn't get. If you came down from the Arctic with a narwhal tusk in your possession, it was possible to sell that in Europe in medieval times as a unicorn tusk. In fact, you could make a lot of money with such an exotic specimen. And in the 15th century, um, great monarchs who died, their wills often show that they had unicorn tusks, polar bear skins, ostrich eggs, things that had come back uh, from exotic voyages and, again, were still there side by side with pieces of the true cross. Uh, but there was this wonderful combination of relics and science. And I will just read you a brief little description from a sailor's journals of things that he ran into. Um, this is actually a, an American sailor who was interested in collecting things, made lists in his journal of uh, plants and animals and rocks that he could get, but was particularly interested when he went to the cathedral um, at Oviedo, Spain, and he wrote in his journal all the things that he saw there, and it gives you a sense of the kind of religious relics that were going side by side with scientific relics. He saw there in 1727 one of St. Stephen the Martyr's hands kept in a box with glass over it, a piece of the Apostle St. Bartholomew's skin, eight of the thorns which were of our Savior's crown, some of the bread of the Last Supper, and of the manna which God fed the children of Israel with in the wilderness, and in a small gilt box, some of the Blessed Virgin's milk with some of her hair, one of the 30 pieces of silver for which Judas sold our Lord. Um, and all those things were there in the same place where you could also see exotic things from the New World brought to Europe. Uh, for Europeans, they all had the same kind of marvelous quality because they all allowed you to come into contact with the object that represented the exotic. And that's what sailors were bringing back with them from all over the world. In certain places, like Amsterdam, which was a great seafaring uh, city, you would find that there were uh, collections springing up as early as the, um, as the 17th century that were called cabinets of curiosities. And the cabinets of curiosities were the place where you would deposit all the things that you brought back from the exotic voyage. And in this uh, particular um, cabinet, which belonged to a professor at Leiden, at Leiden University, whose name was Ole Worm, which is why it's called the Museum Wormiana, um, Ole Worm has here things which have been collected all over the world which not only has he put here so that you can come and view them, but he has also begun the process of organizing them into taxonomic structures. That not only is he going to bring the world into his cabinet, but he's now going to organize it so that we can understand the way the world works.
And up at the top there, you can see um, an Eskimo kayak and a, a polar bear skin preserved, um, all kinds of fishes. Um, and down along the bottom, there is the, uh, there's the elusive, elusive unicorn horn right there. Um, and all kinds of things that represent Dutch voyages both to the Arctic, and you can see the Arctic things, but the other great place that the Dutch are beginning to travel at that time is to the East Indies, and you can see the East Indies goods there as well. So now you have sea turtles, um, you have crocodiles, you have goods from the old and the new world, and all of them are now beginning to be organized according to typological categories. Now, the categories were not always the categories that we would use today. Um, the first way that you might organize things was by color or by shape, so that everything that's round goes together um, and everything that's black goes together. Um, what was Chuck Lee told me about one that was everything that's spherical that was buried in the ground. Um, though that was one category that you might use in order to organize the world. And eventually, for a cabinet of curiosities, two great um, categories were developed. One was artificial curiosities, anything that had felt the hand of man, and natural curiosities, anything that existed in nature. So that you would begin to divide up your cabinet into the rocks and the birds and the shells on the one hand, and shoes and, and weapons and musical instruments on the other. And the native people of various places that were being encountered by sailors well into the 19th century were still being seen as part of the natural world, so that their artificial curiosities were going into natural history museums even into the 19th century. Um, and you can begin to see that here, Ole Warham makes very little distinction between clothing worn by Greenland Eskimos and um, canoes made by them and polar bear skins and other things from the natural world. So you only begin to see um, um, the division into natural and artificial, but you're not yet beginning to see um, the ethnological division of people into their goods in any sort of context in which they would have been used in their own home. Now, it was a number of generations before um, anyone actually decided that it would be worthwhile to put together an expedition and send the expedition out specifically for science. And the first people that did that were the British, and they sent um, Captain James Cook out on three voyages to the Pacific in the late 18th century, and his voyages began to change the way that people looked at the world. And I'll just put a little map up here of Cook's voyages. There we go. Um, Cook's first voyage um, left in 1768, um, and Cook was instructed, um, his primary objective was to go to Tahiti and to observe a celestial phenomenon. And this was the transit of Venus across the sun. And it was hoped that they might be able to triangulate uh, from that. If people watched the same phenomenon in Tahiti, they had people at the observatory in Greenwich, they had people in St. Petersburg, they had people in the Americas, that if they observed it in different places, then they might be able to triangulate and find out the exact circumference of the world. And this was a problem which was still plaguing navigators um, in the 18th century. They still could not exactly determine longitude, and that was the first thing that Cook was supposed to do. Uh, he also was very interested in sailors' health. He was going to see if he could, through a clean ship and through fresh food, um, through um, sauerkraut and onions and scurvy beer, if he could keep his men, men from getting scurvy. And in the mind of the British in the late 18th century, scurvy and the longitude problem were linked because in the 1740s, an expedition had gone out under Sir George Anson, and they had traveled um, into the Pacific around Cape Horn and up along the coast of South America. Uh, they were supposed to rendezvous his two ships at an island called Juan Fernandez, and they could determine their latitude by observing the angle of the North Star above their horizon, but they didn't know the exact circumference of the Earth, and they didn't know, they could not exactly predict their longitude. So as they got up to the correct latitude of the island of Juan Fernandez, each of the ships, one after another, went out into the Pacific in the wrong direction and then had to come back to the island. During the course of that, they lost several weeks and there were so many men ill with scurvy that by the time one surviving vessel limped back to England, 1,300 of 2,000 men had died of the disease. Um, so it was a devastating uh, blow to the British and it was seen that they needed now to invest Royal Navy money in finding a cure for scurvy and also uh, figuring out the longitude problem. 
The British Parliament actually went so far as to offer a big reward for the person who would solve the longitude problem. And there were a lot of entries in this. There were people that had celestial um, uh, formulas for determining longitude by measuring the disk of the moon as it moved across a certain pattern of stars. Uh, there were others that had uh, what were clearly wacky um, ideas. If you knew the exact time where you were and you knew what time it was, well, you could determine your own local noon. If you knew what time it was at some other place, like at Greenwich, you could figure out your longitude from that. And so there was one man that actually entered the longitude uh, contest with an entry that he had created a salve that you could put on a bandage. And if you applied the bandage to a wound, it would cure the wound instantly. And then he had found that if the wound reopened and you applied the salve to the bandage, you no longer even had to put it on the wound, it would still cure the wound. So then he thought, well, what if various ships were carrying a small dog with them out into the Pacific? And if they had some wound, which they would open again every morning, then if they applied the salve back in Greenwich at exactly 12 noon, it would cure the wound and you would know by the wounded puppy that in fact you um, were now at the correct time to determine your longitude. Well, this, of course, was not a winning entry. Um, <laughs> clocks were a problem because most clocks at that time were running on pendulums. And you can imagine a pendulum uh, moving back and forth in your living room. Now picture that on the rolling deck of a ship. A pendulum clock becomes a serious problem at sea. But there was an English um, uh, clockmaker named John Harrison who developed a clock, a spring round clock that could go to sea. And it was on Cook's voyages that they decided to test um, Harrison's chronometer. And so that was one of the things that Captain Cook was going to do. Since he was going out to the Pacific to places that were little known, the leading scientist in England, a guy named Joseph Banks, decided that he would hitch a ride on Cook's first voyage and take a trip out to the Pacific. And Joseph Banks brought with him a young assistant whose name was Daniel Solander. And Solander was an expert in the Linnaean system of classification, which was fairly new at that time. And so Banks had an idea that when they went out, they might find new species of animals and plants. And he and Solander could apply names to them. And in fact, they did find over 800 new plants, which they named on the first voyage of Captain Cook. Um, Banks was a difficult guy to live with. He brought with him on that first voyage uh, four servants, two large dogs, um, and his assistant Daniel Solander, and another guy to take notes for them. But it proved to be the voyage that would define his scientific career. Because as the ship traveled down around, um, coming here along the coast of Australia, um, they eventually uh, worked their way up um, into a place where they came into a bay that Banks and Solander went ashore. And in that bay, they saw so many new species of plants, things which they had never even imagined could exist, that they named the place Botany Bay. Um, and that would later become the great British penal colony. Uh, but Botany Bay was a place where there were so many new species that Banks and Solander uh, quickly went ashore. They did drawings. They collected leaves. Uh, they did pressed samples of plants. And all those things they brought back with them to England. When they came back, Cook was a great hero. Banks was a great hero. They immediately set out on another voyage. And on the second voyage, they were going to go and see if they could find the great southern continent. Um, it was thought at that time that if there was so much land up in the, actually, I, I just noticed that's a really a hard map to read, isn't it? Yeah. When they, um, <laughs> they but th there was a thought that if there was so much land mass in the northern hemisphere of the globe, if the globe was going to spin evenly, then there must be a similar land mass somewhere down in the southern part of the globe. And this was the notion of a great southern continent, the antipodes, the anti-feet, the place where people hung from the earth instead of standing on top of it. Um, and Cook was going to go down and see if he could find the great southern continent. Um, Banks was to go along on this voyage as well. And Banks this time wanted to bring such a large party of servants and dogs and other scientists that he ordered another deck to be built on top of the existing ship that Cook was bringing with him. And so they built another, sh another deck on the Endeavor. And as Cook was sailing it down from Whitby, he said in his log, one of the great things, she sails crank. Uh, wouldn't have it. They got to London, stripped that deck off. Uh, Banks decided not to go. Um, so instead, they brought two um, German scientists, a father and son, uh, Reinhold and Georg, and Georg Forster, 
And this was the voyage on which they also brought um, one of Harrison's chronometers. Um, traveled down, couldn't find the great southern continent. Um, they circumnavigated the two islands of New Zealand and proved that that was not the place. Uh, but they did collect specimens of the same sort that they had collected before. So Cook's voyage, when he came back to England, they were able to give to the British Museum drawings of plants and animals from various places around the Pacific. And I'll just show you some of those. They also uh, published a number of books on what the usefulness might be of some of those plants and animals. One of them was, for instance, on the breadfruit tree and discussing the possibility of using breadfruit trees, transplanting them from Tahiti, one of the islands that Cook had visited, uh, to the West Indies as food for slaves. And a young navigator on Cook's voyage um, by the name of William Bly was the guy who decided to undertake that project himself. Um, and he set out on the bounty, and of course the famous mutiny occurred on Bly's voyage, transporting breadfruit trees from uh, Tahiti to the New World. But this is the sort of biological drawings that they did um, in the course of their voyage, both of plants and also of animals. On the third voyage, Cook became even more serious about this and brought along an artist by the name of John Weber, who could also do drawings of native people and their habitations, like this one at Nootka Sound. The third voyage um, had no scientists at all. In fact, this is one of those sad instances where the captain turned out not to like scientists very much after all. Um, the first example of the split between the deck and the lab. And um, Cook decided he would only bring artists, which is what he brought on his third voyage. But it was on that voyage that Cook was killed. Um, Cook, he was, um, his major uh, destination for that voyage was to go and see if he could find an opening on the western edge of the North American continent that would be the western entrance to the Northwest Passage. And Cook went um, into the Central Pacific, found the Hawaiian Islands, which had never been um, um, visited by any outsider. Uh, from there, proceeded up along the coast of what is now Alaska, hoping to find an opening, went into the Bering Straits, uh, reached ice, came back out, went to Hawaii again. Um, there, uh, in an altercation with the Hawaiians, Cook was killed, and his ship went on around the world. But the publications of the narratives uh, began to introduce people in both Europe and also in America uh, to all kinds of possibilities in the Pacific. And it was really Cook's voyage uh, which began uh, to send American ships looking for trade out into the Pacific. Cook was considered a hero not only in England, um, on his third voyage, which began in 1776, um, Cook was setting out at a time when American privateers were attacking British vessels. And so Benjamin Franklin actually gave Cook a letter to carry on board his ship to show to Americans if they stopped his vessel. And he said, do not plunder or obstruct this most celebrated navigator and discoverer, Captain Cook. His voyage is for the benefit of mankind in general. Uh, so there was a sense that the knowledge that Cook was collecting uh, was more valuable uh, than the war effort. Benjamin Franklin was a good guy to uh, speak on behalf of Cook, too, because Franklin was also interested in some of these kinds of projects. When Benjamin Franklin um, was visiting with his kinsman from Nantucket, a man named Timothy Folger, uh, Timothy Folger told Franklin that he had once seen out in the Atlantic a ship under full sail with the wind coming from behind it and it was traveling backwards. What was this phenomenon, Franklin wanted to know, and Folger started to tell him about the Gulf Stream and Franklin decided that he would do a chart of it. And he went to Nantucket, he asked uh, Folger to go to Nantucket and to look through the journals of whalemen there and to collect information about this phenomenon of the Gulf Stream. And then Franklin published the first chart of the Gulf Stream in 1769. So Franklin was very interested in what Cook was doing. Now, what begins to happen in America at this time after Cook's third voyage is that American captains began to model their own behavior in many ways on the behavior of Captain Cook. That they wanted to have their voyages count for something beyond whatever mercantile um, um, uh, meth, um, um, functions they were, they were instructed to do by their captains. So they wanted also to be able to write the kinds of descriptions of places that Cook had written 
and to collect the kinds of specimens and to bring them back to some institution where they could be examined. And in America, right after the revolution, institutions sprang up which were looking for just that kind of stuff. Um, there was Benjamin Franklin's own American uh, Philosophical Society, which was founded in uh, Philadelphia before the revolution. But most of these great societies, these learned societies after the revolution, were actually formed in Boston. And part of the reason for that is that Boston was at the center of a worldwide trading network. It was to Boston that people could bring back all of this great stuff. And the societies that were founded there, all of them um, were founded with the express purposes of promoting knowledge and that under that in their charters they all say that one of the ways to promote knowledge is to um, prepare a cabinet of curiosities and that in order to have such a cabinet one must have contact with seafarers because seafarers are the ones who can bring the stuff back. So the um, Massachusetts Historical Society which was founded in 1790 said that each member on his admission shall engage to use his utmost endeavors to collect and communicate to the society manuscripts, printed books and pamphlets, historical facts, biographical anecdotes, observations in natural history, specimens of natural and artificial curiosities, and any other matters which may elucidate the natural and political history of America from the earliest times to the present day. And that was the kind of statement that was made by all of these organizations as one after another they formed um, in the Boston area. The American Antiquarian Society, the Boston Athenaeum, uh, the Boston Museum of Natural History, all were looking to seafarers to collect those things and bring them back so that they could, in essence, bring the world back into their own laboratory and examine it um, with their own notions of how things were organized. Now, sailors also began to found their own organizations. And marine societies, which were generally organizations of sea captains, also were founded in a number of cities in Massachusetts. And one of them in Salem, called the East India Marine Society, actually was founded in 1799 with the express purpose of establishing a cabinet to bring back things from beyond the known world, um, to share information about navigation. They also wanted to uh, support their own members and their families if anything happened to them. But they always had a toast. And their toast was, to natural history, may commerce never forget its obligations, and a cabinet that every mariner may possess the history of the world. And there's a wonderful sense in that, that by bringing the world home in its decontextualized artifacts, you could actually somehow understand what it was about. These sailors also began to make the observations and sketches of things of the sort that Captain Cook had made. And we find in many of their journals extremely valuable information um, on ethnology and anthropology. Uh, this is a journal of a Boston vessel um, called the Jefferson, headed out to the Queen Charlotte Islands off the coast of British Columbia in 1794. And he's describing here, the uh, journal keeper is a man named Bernard McGee, and he's describing um, meeting up with some Indians, and the Indian chief wants for the men from the ship to come ashore and to plane a tree that they have felled so that they can carve images into it. And this is, in fact, the first description that we have of a totem pole. Um, what he says is, um, in the afternoon, the carpenter with the, uh, and some hands in the pinnace went to the village at the request of Kunia to plane and smooth a monumental pillar of wood previous it to its erection on the morning. In the evening, returned to the boat, uh, but few natives visited us this day, purchased um, skins there in the sea otter skin trade. Um, and then the next day, they went to the village, took along with us, two spare topmasts for shears and sufficient tackling to set up the pillar which in the afternoon got in its place. After finishing um, the necessary requisites for it, um, its intended purpose of sepulcher of a daughter of Cunia, who was one of the local chiefs, I returned to the ship, um, nobody on board, and then they, he goes back, um, went to the village with some hands at the desire of Cunia in the morning to raise an image on the monument lately set up, which they cut and carved with a great deal of art being the representation of some wild animal unknown to us, somewhat the resemblance of a toad. And in fact, what he's describing is something that looks very much like poles that are still part of the tradition today. Um, and you can see how he might describe this as somewhat the representation of a toad. Um, in fact, these guys are documenting 
um, not only native traditions there, but also their own interaction, which begins to change the way that native life functions on the Northwest Coast. Here's a totem pole as drawn in the 1790s. Um, not very accurately, uh, but it does show that, in fact, uh, sailors were interested in seeing what, what was there. This is what the villages looked like late in the 19th century when the influx of the new tools and the new wealth of this very trade had changed everything about the way the village worked. And then, in fact, what you see now is a forest of totem poles uh, quite different than what um, these sailors had encountered when they first arrived there. So sailors began to be, at this point, not only the documenters of traditional life, but also, like Cook had been, they're the people that begin to set changes in motion, and they document the change as well. Um, on Cook's third voyage, when he went to Hawaii, he instructed his men that if any of them knew they had syphilis, that they should not sleep with any of the native women. And then as the ships are pulling away from the Hawaiian Islands, he has to punish several men for having broken that order. So syphilis is introduced into the Hawaiian Islands by the very first vessel uh, from outside Polynesia that arrives there. Um, and Cook documents that in his own journal. These learned societies also provided information to people like Benjamin Franklin um, that wanted to go and collect, uh, to look at the information, to write about it. And sailors' records began to provide information not only about ethnology um, and natural history, but also about the the ocean world, and Matthew Fontaine Morey, who worked for the hydrographic office in uh, Washington, D.C. That was a hard map to read, I know. Um, actually went around the country um, in the late 1840s looking at whalemen's journals and made a map, the first chart of ocean, um, ocean currents and uh, prevailing winds, and then decided at the same time that since he was using the journals of whalemen, he would also do something useful for whalemen, and he did a, a chart of whale populations around the world as well. Uh, this was from information derived from whalemen's journals uh, that had been provided to him to look at, um, at ocean currents and winds. So there was a great deal of information that began to be traded in the learned societies, in museums, in libraries, um, and also in marine societies, but sailors remain uh, the basic guys to collect the information and bring it back. Voyages also provided opportunities for people that were interested in science uh, to go out and make observations, and that's what happened with Charles Darwin, who went out on a voyage of the Beagle, 1831 to 1836. Um, and in the course of that voyage made observations which he would bring back later and work up into, um, into publications. Darwin said a wonderful thing about his voyage. Darwin is known to have been seasick almost the entire five years that he was at sea. Um, and the only times that he wasn't seasick were the times that he, had, he used the classic cure for seasickness, which is sit under a tree. Um, he got off every time he could. Um, and later he wrote, if it were not for seasickness, the whole world would be sailors. Um, still, he recognized that there was something um, in being able to go out and do the observations that would make him into a better scientist. And that was um, the kind of knowledge uh, that, um, again, inspired both the U.S. and the British to put together expeditions which would go out like Cook's had um, and to see what was out in the world um, and to, um, to come back and report on it. The first American expedition uh, left in 1838 was under the command of a guy named Charles Wilkes. And Wilkes unfortunately proved to be um, a sorry choice uh, from the scientific perspective because uh, Wilkes was another captain who didn't like scientists. Uh, Wilkes managed to get the 25 scientists who were assigned to this whittled down to nine. This was a scientific expedition. They were going out for science, but Wilkes didn't want to deal with scientists. The science that they were um, undertaking had behind it uh, some very strange theories. It was very popular in the US in the 1830s. Um, there was a popular theory that had been presented by a guy named John Cleve Sims. And Sims postulated that the earth was hollow and that there was access into the interior through holes in the poles. Um, and that if you could get down right to the South Pole, you could slip inside the globe. And that, in fact, there might even be people living on that inside lip. Um, and this was picked up with fervor uh, by a couple of writers. One writer wrote about that civilization living inside the globe. In fact, he called it Simsonia after Sims. 
um, Edgar Allan Poe liked that so much, he wrote his book, uh, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, about sailing down into the interior through the hole in the pole. But this was actually the rationale for sending out the first US exploring expedition, that the first thing they would do is go down to the southern latitudes and see if there was a way to get inside the globe through the South Pole. Um, even though it had this, um, this sort of untenable theory behind the major reason for sending the ship out, they still did bring along with them uh, some terrific scientists and people who would have an impact on scientific thought uh, for many generations. Uh, Congress appropriated the money for the voyage. They brought along, um, among other scientists, James Dwight Dana, who was a geologist. In the course of this voyage, Dana would note out in the Pacific that there were certain island chains, including the, the Hawaiian Islands, that were older at one end than at the other. So that either the chain was moving away from its source um, or something else was happening, but he was beginning to look at uh, what would eventually be described as plate tectonics. Uh, there was also um, two naturalists. One of them was Titian Peel, whose father, um, Charles Peel, uh, had a museum, uh, one of the great museums of the time. He named all his children after famous artists, so that Titian Peel had a brother named Rembrandt Peel. Um, they all became painters. Um, Tish and Peel did wonderful drawings on the voyage. They also had two other professional artists. They had botanists, uh, they had a conchologist because they expected to see a lot of conchs. And um, the last scientist was Horatio Hale, whose title was philologist. And he described himself as being someone who was interested in the science of man. And he was there to collect languages and to collect ethnological specimens. He was the person who coined the term anthropology. Um, and 40 years after he came back from the voyage, he's also the guy that would send a young German immigrant named uh, Franz Boas out to look at some of the same places he had been to um, in the Northwest. And Franz Boas is the guy that eventually um, developed uh, the field methods of anthropology that we know today. So this was a voyage that was trying to cover all the bases. They quickly went down to the southern uh, reaches, found that there was no hole in the pole. In fact, there was a lot of ice down there, but they did touch on the Antarctic continent. Um, they traveled uh, from there up into the Pacific. They spent a great deal of time um, at the Columbia River and Puget Sound, uh, traveled to Hawaii, uh, went from there to um, the East Indies, touched on the Asian continent uh, through the Straits of Sunda and eventually back around uh, the Cape of Good Hope and home. Um, when they came back, uh, they went to Congress. Wilkes demanded that everybody on the voyage that had collected anything turn it over to him and then he was prepared to turn it all over to Congress. So he went to Congress, said, you had paid for the voyage, here are your things. And he had 2,000 birds, 150 mammals, 1,000 corals, he had crustaceans and mollusks, 50,000 plants, um, plus hundreds of fossils, minerals, rocks, and 5,000 ethnological artifacts. And all of these he presented to Congress. Congress at that time happened to be sitting on some money that had been given to them by a guy named John Smithson uh, to found some sort of scientific institution. And so at that point, they founded the Smithsonian Institution and put all this stuff that had been collected on the Wilkes expedition into the museum, and that became the foundation of the US National Museum. So Wilkes, um, the expedition was one that brought the American flag around the globe, but also in a sense, brought the globe back into Washington, D.C. Because again, there was a notion that you could look at the artifact and that from that you could know something about the person who made it, or you could look at the plant specimen and you could know something about the environment from which it came, and that somehow from all that you could understand the world. They were, at this time, even in the middle of the 19th century, still having some problems figuring out how to organize things. It was common at this time to organize the ethnological things by type. So that if you went into a museum, you would see all the weapons laid out in one case and all the shoes laid out in another. And this led to um, a very uh, lame-brained kind of scheme by a guy named Pitt Rivers in England that he thought, if you could put those weapons out from the least advanced to the most advanced, that you could also then maybe figure out who were the least advanced and the most advanced people on Earth. So that if you started with a rock and a stick and a boomerang on one end and went up to an English rifle, um, that you would always be able to prove that the English were the most advanced people on Earth. And he likes to, uh, to equate this with skulls. Um, you could put a skull above each weapon and you would generally get the Irish or, uh, or Australian Aborigines down on one end, the low end of the spectrum, uh, raising up to uh, the English on the other end. So there's a question of how to organize this material. 
This is still a problem for museums because there's, uh, there are some people that wonder why it is that ethnological items are in natural history museums rather than in art museums. But it all comes um, from this tradition of collecting in the 18th and 19th century. In the last quarter of the 19th century, for the first time, um, an expedition was proposed which instead of taking a ship out and looking at what was beyond the water, uh, would go out and look at what was in the water. And this was a big change. Captain Cook, which had been seen as strictly a scientific expedition, he never did any sampling. Um, he never did any charting that wasn't for navigational purposes. Um, he collected fish to show new specimens, but he wasn't particularly interested in the watery environment. He was just interested in the exotic environment. He was interested in any place that people hadn't seen before. So Hawaii is just as good as what's underwater. Um, the British decided in 1872 to send out the first expedition that today we would actually call an oceanographic expedition. And that, on a vessel called the Challenger, a steam-powered vessel, still carried sails, looked a bit like this. The Challenger went out on a three-year expedition uh, to go around the world, um, and in fact, they went back and forth many times in several places. Um, they traveled, in fact, over 80,000 actual miles. Um, it was a very long venture. They were interested now in looking to see what was in the water. They wanted to collect samples with nets. They wanted to see if they could actually map what the bottom of the sea looked like. So they were going to um, do soundings, uh, which they actually did with a piece of lead at the end of a rope. And they lowered it down over the side, and then they brought it back up and they would measure how much of the rope was wet, and from that determine how deep it was. Um, this was the old sailor's way of determining what the depth was when you were near shore. But the Challenger actually went out to some places where they measured depths of greater than 30,000 feet. Fortunately, they had a steam winch to bring their rope back up. Otherwise, they would have been all day hauling on the rope. Um, but the Challenger did uh, dredging and sounding and hauled nets behind them to collect samples. Um, and they were really the first oceanographic expedition. They had a couple of primary goals. One was, there was a theory current at that time of Professor Edward Forbes, a Scotsman, who thought that below a certain depth, um, which was about 300 fathoms, that below that depth, life could not exist because it couldn't exist without light um, and oxygen. And so one of the things that the Challenger people were going to do was they were going to send nets down to that depth and they were going to see if there was life down there. In fact, they found there was a lot of life down there. They identified a total of um, 4,700 new species of plant and animal life while they were out on the voyage. Uh, they also um, sampled water for temperature and salinity. And one of my favorite things that they did was they disproved the theory that you could look at something called Bathybius as the primal ooze. Uh, Bathybius turned out to be bottom samples mixed with alcohol, which had sat on a shelf for a long time and turned from that into the primordial ooze. And they found they could recreate it by adding alcohol to bottom samples on the Challenger expedition. And that, in fact, if all life did come from the sea, it didn't come from that particular ooze. Um, they produced 50 volumes of uh, findings that they published over about a 20-year period. Uh, so it was a, an expedition which would set the groundwork, um, or in this case, the waterwork, for um, all the expeditions which would follow it. The Challenger went out with a steam winch, which helped to deploy equipment. It also had steam power, which made a difference. And so it really also begins to, um, uh, to signal the end of uh, the great age of scientific voyaging, which would travel under sail. But there were a few vessels uh, which survived that period and went out under sail anyway. And I would be very remiss if I did not mention um, this one, which is on the uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's <coughs> logo. Oh yeah, in fact, there it is. Uh, this is the Atlantis, which was uh, launched in 1931. Between 1931 and 1966, made 299 cruises for Hui. Um, it went out to do all kinds of expeditions. It had a steel hull, so it's not, um, it's uh, in a different tradition than other kinds of uh, sailing ventures. There was another vessel a little bit earlier called the Carnegie, which was the last of the great wooden hulled um, sailing voyages. And that 
uh, founded by the Carnegie Institute in Washington, was made out of wood because their major um, purpose in sending this vessel out was to map magnetic variation. And they didn't want to have anything that was made out of iron or steel on board the ship. The only iron on the whole vessel was in the wire that was in the winch that they used to deploy equipment. All other metal was either copper or um, or bronze, and eventually that vessel, unfortunately in 1929 on the seventh voyage, um, exploded in Samoa um, while taking on gasoline um, and disappeared. So the Atlantis was uh, the major sailing vessel of that time, and today there really only are a couple of very serious vessels out doing scientific voyaging under sail, and these are the two most important. Um, the, in fact, what we do at SEA is very much in the tradition of uh, the early voyages and very different than what HUI does today. Um, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, uh, with its larger, more modern vessels, uh, tends to go today out to a single site to do research and not to do uh, the extended voyage where they um, collect specimens and do analysis over the, the period of, um, over an extended period uh, and cruise track. And so what we do at the Sea Education Association is really more in the wake of Captain Cook. Um, we still send our students out on these two vessels, uh, the Westward and the Corwith Kramer, uh, to go out for six weeks and to follow a cruise track and along that track uh, to do their sampling and their collecting and from the samples and collections that they make on board um, to analyze and come up with theories um, and write papers and get grades. Um, so it is a, uh, it's a long tradition in which we participate. Um, but it is one that um, really does go back um, to, in one sense, the sort of uh, first application of knowledge in the great library at Alexandria, uh, but also has its roots in um, the collections and museums uh, that have been so much a part of the American uh, intellectual landscape since soon after the Revolutionary War. So with that, I will wrap up and see if there are any questions. And I've brought some of my scientist pals along in case you have questions about science at SEA, which I do not respond to, um, but I would be happy to take those questions. So thank you. Um, are there questions? Ooh. I know I talk fast. You know, it's. It is now known that you can actually comprehend speech at about two and a half times normal speed, and that's what I'm working up to. <laughs> yes? How long did each of the They lasted about three years each. Um, you know, it's a sad thing when you think about what it means to be a sailor in that time. When Cook was on his second voyage, he returned to England to find that three of his six children had died, um, so that for him, uh, being involved in those voyages meant that he really did leave the rest of his life behind. Um, it, was a, it was a hard time for these extended voyages. The other thing is that during the whole time that he was out, he was completely out of contact with anyone back home. There was no way uh, to get any sort of message or information out. So that um, in their journals, these sailors often describe that moment when they're coming back to shore um, as one of tremendous anxiety, just worrying about what happened during the time that you were away. Yes? Well, Cook, in fact, was one of the guys that was trying various methods to see if he could keep scurvy from breaking out on his ship. And he had limes on board, but he also was making um, what he called scurvy beer um, out of spruce and other things that they would gather along the way. He had um, onions, which also are a source of vitamin C. Um, they had sauerkraut. They kept a scrupulously clean ship. Uh, they did a lot of exercising. No man died of scurvy, but unfortunately, he had tried so much stuff that they couldn't identify exactly what it was that had prevented it. So it really took another 40 years after Cook's voyage um, for a, a British doctor uh, to pinpoint that, in fact, it was the lack of vitamin C. And soon after, they began to require that lime juice be part of the daily rations on, uh, on British vessels. And that's why uh, British ships were known as lime juicers and, and uh, British sailors were known as limeys. So Cook um, had no scurvy on board, but did not make the connection to lime juice. And it really was uh, within just the next generation that there were, um, that there was a, uh, another um, several captains that dedicated their, uh, their voyages to trying to, to discover what it was that caused scurvy.
They did know that if you were ashore, that you didn't get it as commonly as when you were at sea. And in fact, in Anson's voyage um, in his journal, Anson is the guy that lost 1,300 of his 2,000 men. There was a point at which he knew that if he could get ashore, he could save some of the men. And he had one officer um, who was also his close friend. Um, and Anson had a, a, a box on the deck that was filled with dirt where he was growing vegetables. And if he had fed the vegetables to the guys, they probably would have done um, pretty well. But in fact, he took all the vegetables out and threw them overboard and planted this officer into the dirt of the garden to see if, the, if it was the earth itself, uh, which in fact was going to be the cure for scurvy. And of course, it proved that it wasn't, and he died anyway. But that Anson voyage was a devastating blow to the British and really did bring home uh, the dangers of uh, both not knowing your longitude and also uh, the dangers of scurvy. Um, in addition to the, uh, the English tradition, which, which uh, was transplanted to the United States and, uh, and certainly other European countries had a uh, tradition of, of exploration of sea, is there any documentation of historical exploration from other peoples, from uh, uh, people from the Far East, for example, the Chinese do that, uh, the Polynesians actually explore sea, or mm -hmm. just communicating. The Chinese, in fact, had a period of tremendous exploration, which was in the 15th century. And there was a, a man in the Chinese court named Cheng Ho who organized a tremendous expedition down into the Indian Ocean and along the coast of Africa. They brought a giraffe back to Peking. Um, they brought back wondrous things from Africa. Um, and there was tremendous interest for a short period of time among the Chinese and what was out there in the world beyond them. But the reality of the way the world worked was that everybody else was beating a path to China's door, bringing them whatever they had in exchange for Chinese commodities, which were much more valuable. Um, and the Chinese eventually uh, developed an exclusionary policy uh, where they, they uh, became um, closed to any sort of outside influence or outside contact. And uh, up until the middle of the 19th century, um, the Chinese backed into uh, Peking and allowed outsiders only to come into one port at Canton. So the Chinese abandoned um, their expeditions soon after the turn of the 15th century. Um, there was also a lot of travel that went along, um, around in Polynesia. And certainly the people from New Zealand and the people from Hawaii um, are related linguistically and culturally. Um, but those voyages did not go back and forth. Uh, the people that went from New Zealand up to Hawaii stayed there. And even though the Polynesians were great navigators and traveled extensively in trade networks around the Pacific, um, it's not known that they ever reached either Asia or uh, the coast of the Americas on any sort of voyage which was then repeated. Um, but certainly, when, the, when Captain Cook arrived in the Hawaiian Islands, he found that the people there were excellent navigators, had terrific boats, um, had uh, stick charts and other ways of uh, navigating. And the same was true on the northwest coast, that it was not uncommon uh, for voyages to be made of 1,000 miles from Alaska down to the coast of what's now Washington State on uh, repeated trading voyages. So there were other people that had mostly trade networks. Um, but the notion of exploration and exploration for scientific uh, sake, except for those, that one period of Chinese voyaging is really a Western European phenomenon. And you haven't mentioned Portuguese or Spanish. Right. Great navigators. And Terrific navigators, yes. Uh, were they any scientific expedition or were they just interested in getting the gold of the East Japan and the Yeah. Um, the Portuguese, to my knowledge, did not enter into uh, the great sort of voyages of exploration, which were really a phenomenon of the 18th century, as something separate from trade. Trade is always, you know, really the first feelers out into various places. For Americans, you know, whalemen had gone to every place that the Wilkes expedition did long before Wilkes did. So that in terms of exploration, to explore for new products was the real way um, that landfalls became known. But in the 18th century, when you got this great interest in science, it was really the British. Um, the Spanish did send some voyages out to the um, to the Pacific. Uh, the major one was under a captain named Malaspina. Um, but unfortunately, Malaspina uh, became uh, some sort of an outcast for reasons which aren't really clear when he came back to Spain. And the Spanish pretty much cut off those voyages of exploration. Similarly, the French sent out their great voyage, um, La Perouse, which went out and was lost in the Pacific. 
Um, but had La Perouse actually come back to France, he would have found that his patron, the king, uh, was now dead. Everything was changed. And with that change in government in France, they also stopped sending out the, um, the voyages of exploration. So it is, um, it's largely a British phenomenon of the 18th century. And for Americans, um, it's always linked to trade. Uh, but there is, there is um, certainly the Wilkes expedition, which was uh, comparable to anything that the British sent out. Yes? Um, what Columbus did, yeah, which was so astonishing and different than what anyone else had done up to that point, is that Columbus sailed directly away from land and out of the sight of land with the wind coming behind him. Um, and that was something that no one had done up to that point. The Portuguese had done all of their voyages down along the coast of Africa, always keeping land within sight. Um, so that, or within sight for, a, you know, within a day's view. So that um, for Columbus to head out to the west uh, really did break with a very long maritime tradition that up until that point all voyages had, uh, had been inside of land. And in fact, instead of charts, representations of where you were traveling, um, navigational texts were called portolanos. And a portolano actually described everything that you would see along the way. You know, if you're traveling along the Mediterranean coast, First you see the big tree, then you see the ruined castle, then you see the, and that was how you would navigate, by following along and seeing what everything was. Um, Columbus's great error was that he thought that it would be about, um, I think he thought it was about 2,700 miles from Spain to Japan, and it's closer to 12,000 miles. Um, so <laughs> so that, was, that was Columbus's great error. Columbus, you know, also, he made four voyages to the New World, and he never would admit until the day he died uh, that it was not Asia. He still thought that somewhere, somebody was speaking Japanese, and he just wasn't finding them. Judy. Um, Well, I think that at SEA uh, we do have uh, those lines crossed on a regular sort of basis. Um, but it is true that the deck and the lab uh, tend to remain very separate, I think, on most research vessels. Um, and what we try to do in our, in our C semester is we have our students uh, that do one watch in the lab and then the next watch on deck so that at the end they're hopefully competent sailors and competent scientists. But for the most part, if you make a career at sea, you choose one or the other. Oh. The famous case of the Comte de Tremonville, French, uh, uh, French sea captain who made a meteoric rise in the French Navy, was given command of several voyages of exploration in the North Atlantic, but he wasn't really so much interested in, in boats. He had done this before, he became interested in snakes and spiders and mountains, and he would typically sail from the Hop, and they would go to uh, Spitsbergen or Greenland or French Canada, and he would give all the ships over to the lieutenant on the make maps while he went and discovered snakes. There you have it. Yeah. And spiders and mountains. You really can't do both, and he chose, uh, he chose the science rather than the sailing. So. Are there other great uh, sailor scientists? Yeah. Oh right, yes. The first wasn't he the first master of the uh, of the Atlantis? Yes. yes. Yeah, there are a few. Any other questions? Thank you very much.